Welcome to Financial Repression Authority's Roundtable Insight, where the best fund managers, economists, and industry leaders discuss the key investment issues and challenges in the current macroeconomic environment. Hi, welcome to FRA's Roundtable Insight. This is host Richard Benuli. Today is Wednesday, November 8th, and we have Mark Chandler and Ira Harris. In terms of their background, we have uh, Mark is Managing Partner and Chief Market Strategist at Bannockburn Global Forex. He's been covering the global capital markets for more than 30 years, working at economic consulting firms and global investment banks. His second book was published with the title Political Economy of Tomorrow and takes an insightful look at the concept of surplus. And Ira is global consultant, uh, hedge fund manager, and uh, independent trader. He's been trading foreign currencies, equities, bonds, and commodities for over 40 years. He was also CME director from 1997 to 2003 and a stint most recently. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks, Richard. Let me get rid of this. Great. I thought we'd begin, uh, Mark, with your view, your uh, macro view on the economy, global economy, and the financial markets in general. Yeah, sure. You know, I, I think that we are at a uh, an inflection point. Uh, we've had uh, a series of crises um, where, like, everything that could go wrong. I mean, think about the pandemic. Uh, the reaction to the pandemic, uh, policy response, and then having to unwind that, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, and what seems to be the breakdown of deterrence, uh, not only uh, Ukraine and Russia, but also uh, in the Middle East. And so the markets are having to uh, uh, to come to grips with this, and same, you know, broadly speaking, and I think that uh, once again, like we saw after the great financial crisis, uh, the U.S., is just can act uh, bigger and bolder uh, than many other countries. And so the U.S. economy has outperformed since the pandemic uh, almost every other uh, large economy. And part of that is a function of going big, not only the Federal Reserve uh, slashing interest rates and expanding its balance sheet, uh, which other central banks did as well, uh, but also the large amount of fiscal spending the U.S. was willing to commit to. And of course, this wasn't just uh, post-COVID, but it was even before COVID, the U.S. fiscal stimulus uh, during a time when the economy had seemed to be growing close to trend. And so now I think where we are is that we're at this turning point after a very strong Q3 GDP once again, we have this uh, window, this inflection, possible inflection point where the U.S. economy does slow down. Uh, partly we're seeing some late stage developments, whether it's uh, consumer debt stress levels. Other various economic indicators have been flashing warning signs for quite some time. Though of course, not all of them. And so I think that the dollar's big rally uh, that's really been in place for the better part of the, of the decade uh, post the great financial crisis, I think that that might be over. Uh, it's not clear yet, but that's my leaning. And I think that the extreme might have been made last September, October. We had that British... Uh, uh, that little British crisis, sterling fell to record lows near 103 and a half. The euro fell to almost 96 and a half cents. We had a big rally. And then the U.S., we had a big rally of recovery of those foreign currencies until the summer. And once again in the summer, it looked like the, the divergence, the U.S. outperforming uh, other countries again in a very strong way and led to another leg up in the dollar. Uh, and I think that that leg up in the dollar is coming to an end as the market begins once again, anticipating a slowdown in the economy and more importantly, the end of Fed tightening. I think the dollar stood on on a, the dollar's base was narrowing to one leg and that one leg was the Federal Reserve. And when that turns, I think the dollar turns. And I think that's where we sort of where we sit here today, post the uh, uh, the uh, the early November FOMC meeting and the softer than expected jobs data, uh, the market once again is pricing in, uh, say, three cuts, maybe a little bit more than three cuts next year, while the Federal Reserve says only two are likely. Hmm. Very interesting. And your thoughts, Ira? Well, you know, I'm not, I watched the Fed closely, and this morning, we we actually, Powell gave a 
well, an interesting, I, I don't even know why I recalled his speech. I just read it before we came on. But Lisa Cook was kind of interesting. And, and, and Lisa Cook, and I've talked about this, I know, with Joseph Wing uh, last week, and I know I'm doing another podcast today, but we may as well get into it, the politics oh. of the Fed. And there are plenty of politics at the Fed. And most people forget there, there are four Biden governors appointed. And I believe that they were all vetted, especially by uh, Leo Brainerd, who up and left the Fed because if she wasn't going to be chair, I think she's next in line to be chair. If Powell were to resign for some reason, uh, I think she would be elevated, just my guess. But we have four new Biden appointees who are all labor economists. Now, being a labor, it, that's not a... Um, that's not a slight. I have a lot of respect for a lot of labor economists, but they do tend to err on making the employment man mandate job one, all pun intended. Um, and they, I think they, they err on the side of being somewhat dovish. Now, interestingly, I thought Lisa Cook today was very dovish because she really embarked upon what Mark and I would find very comfortable, the global macro view as much as anything to determine where the Fed is at. And yesterday we had Waller. Now Waller seems, you know, a lot of people think that Waller is Powell's confidant. I'm not there. I don't know, but they seem to be. And Waller was pretty dovish yesterday. The only one who's still of the governors is um, uh, Bowman, but she was a, uh, a Trump appointee, I believe. She's been there a little bit longer. But that I agree with Mark. I think the Fed is going to be not even that they have to cut rates because they have ways, as Powell talks about, threading this needle, right? We're, we're, we're in, you know, if we go back four years, three, three years, there was 18 trillion of nominative, nominal, not real, but nominal negative yields on sovereign debt. How do we come out from all of this? Nobody knows. This is an event we have never seen. And I think Mark and I, we should, we're very sympathetic on our, we have pretty a, a deep knowledge of economic history, both American and global, and we've never seen this. So everybody who's forecasting out of here, they have no, no background to really, because we've never been here. And I think that these Biden appointees, I, I think Powell has a real problem here because the Biden appointees, he, he's a consensus builder. He strives for unanimity. Uh, the last negative vote we've seen was, I think, Esther George, maybe, maybe, um, uh, what's her name from Cleveland? Uh, uh, nice check. Mister. Yeah, Mester. Uh, Loretta. I always think of the Beatles. So sweet Loretta. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I think that there, there is a problem here because now, and, and we're in the throes of the 2024 election. And where will they go? You know, I think the, the Fed, will, and the Fed is political. For all those people who say the Fed's not political. I mean, we can go back to McChes McChesney Martin. We can go back to certainly Arthur Byrne. We can go back. Um, I might even venture to say maybe Powell was a little more political, uh, not Powell, but uh, Volcker was a little more po political than people think. I mean, it, he, but he served under Carter, who had enough gumption to do. But again, as I always talk about, Volcker only had to deal with a 39% deficit to GDP ratio. If he had to deal with 105 or 106 or 107%, there's no way he could have done what he did without bringing the, the entire global system to its knees. And I'm not sure that we're not seeing that somewhat now if you listen to, to Lisa Cook. So there's some dovishness. Now, what will it impact? I don't know. I think Mark's, you know, I, and Mark is always out there talking about the dollar. And I think his points from last year were right. They're absolutely right. I agreed with him when he wrote them. The differential did play out. But how long will this play out? I mean, I, Mark, I don't know. When I look at the yen, the yen is the most undervalued currency in the world. And, I, and I'm sitting here with a sheet. And I say that only because now Japanese exports are starting to grow again. And that, we, and that weak yen is, I think, a problem for the Germans. You know, I'm looking at Euro yen at what, what 161? Where are, we, where are we at this morning? 161. That's a phenomenal. And, and, and Germany and Japan compete head on. So there's a lot to go with here. And where, 
And if, if we go to the Fed, you know, you know, and I raise this issue, Mark, and I, I don't know what you're going to think about it, but if the Fed, was, their first step should be cut the interest on interest on, on excess reserves. You don't even have to go to the Fed funds. I know that it will throw their whole operation, but up until 2008, the Fed never even paid interest on excess reserves. And we've seen the Swiss and the ECB now move that direction. So, you know, I... I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I don't really fully understand uh, the logic of paying businesses, that is banks, to do what other businesses do as a principle. And that is, like we would tell our, our kids, uh, have some money put aside to pay for your mortgage uh, in case you lose your job or have like a rainy day fund. And uh, banks should do that, and they should not be compensated for that. And so it's interesting. I had a, a little debate with the Fed about this because they would insist that when they make the announcement, they say, we pay this amount of money on excessive reserves. I go, that's true, but you also pay on, on required reserves. And they've changed the language around that, uh, probably not because of me, but I imagine that they had a broader pushback. But uh, but broadly speaking, I, I, I think that... Uh, I agree with your point that the Federal Reserve, that Powell is a consensus builder. And what strikes me is that, the, you know, that, that uh, George dissent you mentioned was when the Federal Reserve decided to hike rate 75 instead of 50 basis points. She, she, brought, she thought the messaging wasn't clear. And so she opted, she'd favored that 50 basis points. But I, I'm struck with the idea that uh, whether they are Biden appointees on the Board of Governors or leftovers from uh, the previous administrations uh, that is that all this hard work uh, both the uh, uh, the added during the covid crisis the unwinding of it uh, the subsequent rate hikes have all been done with very little dissent and i, I think that we we it's sort of like two horns of the of the dilemma either there's groupthink or uh, there is, uh, or it's highly politicized. And I, I think that uh, probably the sort of someplace in the middle where I, I kind of believe, perhaps it's naive, uh, that when people get to the Federal Reserve, they're professionals and they might have political views, partisan views, but I don't really see them being expressed. I see almost all of the Federal Reserve now cautioning that sort of the, I think they're all reading from the same song sheet. We've raised rates quite a bit. We're in restrictive territory. We don't know if this is enough, but most of us at the Federal Reserve, I think they'd say, most of us think that this could be enough. We're not sure. Uh, we keep the door open. And Powell, I think, was very clear uh, that because uh, someone asked him, one of the reporters asked him, well, is this really an easing bias? Have you given up the tightening bias? And he was, he said he didn't, he wasn't that, he didn't use that language, he said, but it's wrong. They have not given up a tightening bias. And so I, I, I think that the, uh, for me, the challenge is, is not just what the Federal Reserve says, but how the market interprets them. And I think that almost at every point along the way, the market has uh, agreed with you, uh, Yara, that the uh, uh, that there's some kind of dovish, dovish tint, a dovish underlying message to Powell. So almost every time he, so to me, the standard pattern is something like this. Not that it works every time, but most of the time, it seems the market reacts to the statement. It sounds hawkish, and then Powell begins talking, and the market's reversed because the market sees him as dovish. And I'm not quite there yet. I don't really know if I see Powell as dovish. I do think though that the market is just more dovish than the Federal Reserve. Uh, the, the Federal Reserve said uh, back in September, uh, excuse me, back in June, they might cut rates four times in 2024. And then in September, they said, well, maybe only twice. And the markets have consistently throughout, I think, the cycle converged with the Federal Reserve rather than the Federal Reserve converging to the market. And perhaps this time in 2024, it'll be different where the Federal Reserve is forced to cut rates more aggressively. Interesting. Any thoughts on other parts of the yield curve? Like, do you see potential long-term yield curve control policy by the Federal Reserve? Mark? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm afraid that uh, ideas like a negative interest rates, uh, yield curve control, and I even wonder about the uh, about this fiscal dominance. Would Fed policy be different today if the if the federal debt 
was half of what it was, half of what it is. And I'm not so sure that on a cyclical basis, the, uh, uh, you know, when the Federal Reserve meets, that it's really taking into account uh, the debt servicing costs, which, of course, is skyrocketing. And it's not just the Federal Reserve. Think about it. I think the Yara's point about the uh, about the Japanese higher debt to GDP, larger uh, larger central bank balance sheet to GDP than the U.S. and the, and gov the governor of the Bank of Japan denied that its policy is really being influenced by the large debt that the government carries. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, that could just be the, what we'd say declaratory policy as opposed to the, uh, excuse me, that could be this, what they say, declaratory policy as opposed to the operational policy, what they really do. But I think that the economic logic, I mean, look what's going to happen. The Japanese economy, uh, first, uh, Yara's point uh, that with the big currency shift, what this means is that the Japanese economy probably is not the third largest economy in the world anymore, but likely to be replaced by Germany, even though Germany is contracting. And that's because of this huge uh, exchange rate adjustment that Yara mentioned. Uh, but I think that the... Uh, uh, that the Japanese economy likely would have contracted in Q2 if it wasn't for tourism, which is also a function, at least partly, of a weaker yen. And in Q3, which they're going to report next week, the economy likely contracted. And we see that even though they're very proud of the wage success in the in the last spring round, real wages are still falling below. Their real wages are negative. And that's really a difference, say, between the U.S., where real wages that is, wage growth adjusted for inflation is slightly positive, which helps our consumption. Hmm. Interesting perspective. And your thought, Ira? Well, let's go back. So if we go back to the Fed, they're a very interesting group here, because especially the governors and Lori Logan have talked about that the market is doing their work for them, right? Now, this is a group that in no uncertain terms has spent the last 15 years pissing on the markets and saying, you don't know what you're talking about. We're going to do, except that when the markets would rebel, there was the greatest mistake made to me in the last 20 years was Bernanke taper tantrum because the markets were going to do the work for him. He didn't like how fast it was coming, but they were going to start correcting some of the excesses in QE because we had already gone one, two, three. Now we wanted to, and as soon as the markets pushed him, he, he ran tail. To me, great mistake. Just like Powell made a gigantic mistake in 18, not for doing either QT or raising rates as he did to two and a half to two and three quarters, but he did them together. And not knowing where this was going to go, doing them together, as Stan Druckenmiller called it, the double shotgun approach, was, which Druckenmiller said in December of 2018 was a gigantic mistake, but we had already seen that already. But I'll tell you that Rick Santelli and I talked about that in July. Do one or the other. I said, I really thought they should have raised rates immediately to 2% from, from the 0 to 25, uh, or from wherever they were at. Yeah, 0 to 25, 25 to 50, and said, we're going to stop here at 2%. The market knows we're going to be at 2%. And we're going to start curtailing the balance sheet. Would have been a much, but to do both, then got them into trouble. And then, of course, we get the Powell pivot come January. And then by September, with the massive slowdown in the reserves and 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 all the uh, havoc that was taking place, they had to reverse. And, and these are these are very interesting things. So now, why is this Fed, who has fought market signaling mechanisms, as I would say, and I, and I believe that, now all of a sudden going, well, the markets are signaling yeah, on the long end that you know, and they're doing the work for us. But to me, that's the way. I think that's only comes about because Powell's trying to, to get consensus and nothing works better. So he can placate the, the, the doves by saying, we're not raising because the market's doing it for us. And he can placate the hawks because the market's doing it for us. So it's a very nice position. But I'm always interested that this group who has nothing but disdain for market forces are now, are now relying on market forces. And on the, the Japanese, I see... A little bit differently. Yes, they've got debt, but they can fund that debt. And that's a domestic debt issue, more like with the United States, which is a not just a domestic issue, it's a huge global issue because of the huge amount, the large amount of debt that's held by foreigners, US debt. So Japan can be in a little bit of a different situation. And I've disagreed with their yield curve control from the day Corona did it when it was that in 2016. I thought it was 
going to be a giant mistake, just like with Phil Lowe with the uh, with the Australians. But I will say this, and nobody counters this: the Bank of Japan is also they only, they not only did QE, but they did QQE, right? Qualitative and quantitative easing. So they own a lot of equities. I would venture to say we haven't seen these numbers. Now we saw the Swiss numbers yesterday on their foreign holdings, which I watch closely because I think the SNB is a very important. If I was doing, if I was in graduate school now and I was doing my dissertation, it would be on the SNB and how they have manipulated and been the come, become the greatest alchemist in the in the world, uh, probably the world has ever seen because they've taken Swiss francs and converted them into global equities. But the Bank of Japan owns a lot of REITs and ETFs that they have, I would venture to say, pretty big profits on. So their balance sheet is going to, it's a mixed bag. They don't, they're not releasing us and telling us. And, you know, and they can also push them off the question or Chukin and the postal save. You know, there's a lot of things to play out here. So that's what makes me think. And I'm not sure that the United States and the, hasn't given a, a nod and a wink to the weekend. Because a lot of times the United States doesn't like the weekend. You know, I would go back to Bill Clinton and, uh, 1998 on his way to Beijing when the United States under Bob Rubin intervened to support the end at the behest of the Chinese, I might add. So that was June of, of 19. So we've seen this, but are they allowing the weekend because there's a huge amount of reshoring going back to Japan from, from autos to, to microchips to uh, semiconductor. There's all kinds of stuff going on. And are they wanting to do that to get that out of China and give Japan. I mean, it, I don't know that for a fact. I don't know that in any way. I listened to Louis Gavay talk about it, and I think Louis Gavay has really a good point on that. So, again, as, as we open up the discussion, and Mark, there are so many things going on in this world that it, it's really difficult to know, but these forces are being unleashed on us. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think that that's really the challenge is that uh, uh, someone's trying to follow macro and there seems to be so many uh, moving pieces and in unprecedented ways, uh, like uh, not only QE, uh, relatively unprecedented, though the Japanese have been doing what they call Rinban operations, buying government bonds for a long time before we thought of it as QE. But I just, I, I, I wonder, to, to me, the uh, I'd say that... Uh, Two things. One is that I think that the markets typically underestimate the power of the communication channel. So, for example, in uh, in September of uh, 2022, uh, excuse me, of 2021, when the, when Powell said that the Federal Reserve will be taking away the punch bowl, it will be raising interest rates. The U.S. two-year note yield rose about 50 basis points before the Fed first hiked rates. This is to me the the power of the communication channel. And secondly, I'd say that I, I, I do agree that the Federal Reserve seems to have been spooked now since the end of July, say from the end of July through, uh, say, the jobs data or so, the uh, the 10 year bond yield jumped 100 basis points. And so that's a say call it about three months, 100 basis points in three months is a very sharp move for the 10 year yield. And I think what the Federal Reserve is trying to figure out is why did the, why did the yield rise? How much of it is because of uh, supply? which is one of the factors I thought, how much of it is also just driven by the change in what the Fed signaled from four rate cuts to two rate cuts. Right away, that would suggest to me that the 50 basis points increase in the 10 year could be attributed to just changing overnight expectations. And the Federal Reserve also, they talk about a term premium. So how much of the rise in yields is a term premium? And to me, if there's one word that I thought was really important from Powell, it, in the past, it'd be patience, caution. But this past, uh, the past FOMC meeting, I think the key word was persistence. Because a short term move, a short term move in, in yields is important for traders. It might be important for people trying to time when they lock in their mortgages. But for a policy making point of view, not so important. And so we, we did see a big pullback. The, the U.S. 10-year got above 5%. And then by the after the jobs data, we were down at about 460, 40 basis point pullback in, say, a week's time, two weeks' time. And so I think the volatility of the bond market, which might also be to your point about uh, the volatility just in general and the, the size of the balance sheets and the size of the central bank operations and how important the international community is for the U.S. Treasury market. But I think that most of the U.S. challenges 
economic challenges, social challenges. And I'm thinking about longevity falling in the United States. I'm thinking about disparity of wealth and power in the United States. Our problems, I think, are homegrown. Our most important problem, and the reason that China might be caught in sort of the middle income trap is not because of Washington. It's because of their own policies at home. Sure, the external, the geopolitical environment might not help either side reach their objectives, but the primary challenges for China are inside China, and the primary challenges of the U.S. are inside the U.S. So I'm reluctant to to blame whether it's China, uh, Berlin, Tokyo, uh, Hanoi for uh, U.S problems. I think that a lot of our problems could be addressed through U.S. law, but I'm afraid that we have reached a point in the U.S. where some of the interests have captured the different, I mean, I think about like the taxes on corporations and loopholes, uh, 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 pharmaceutical companies locking, you know, taking advantage of Ireland's low taxes. I think about, uh, for me, globalization is a lot more than just tax arbitrage, but there is this rule, and I think that uh, the, the reason that it exists is partly because of this problem that we have in the U.S. where the president agrees to one thing and he doesn't always get congressional approval. This might go back uh, maybe I remember when you were a kid with Woodrow Wilson uh, trying to get the League of Nations. <laughs> huh? He approved the League of Nations. Congress didn't. And there's a whole series of international agreements that have been struck which the U.S. doesn't sign on to, including one of the tr one of Biden's uh, what I thought was going to be one of his uh, hallmark uh, legislative successes was the uh, coordinating international corporate tax reform. And now it looks like while the rest of the world may pass it and begin adopting it, the U.S. might not. I, I, I think there's, yes, you know, so much truth to that. And let's beginning with the U.S., it's, it's all domestic. Whatever's going on, Internationally, yes, you know, uh, we, you know, we had Jake Sullivan's speech from uh, Brookings back in April, you know, with the new industrial policy, and I, uh, and I've read that several times because I've tried to see where they're going here, but there's a lot of things missing in there. But I know it's a small yard with a with a with a high fence, but that's automatically going to bring some inflation. As quote unquote, if you deglobalize in the in where we just allowed. Uh, capital to roam the globe in search of labor arbitrage. That's the true arbitrage going on or was going on. You, the Fed got, they got complacent too because prices, you had a lot of downward pressure on global prices. Well, that's certainly over now, regardless. But the problem is still domestic. And I'm a, as we, I'm a debt person. Debt, because there's not a financial crisis that happens in the world without being fomented by too much debt. And the United States political problems, regardless. And Mark, I don't go into partisan issues because partisan issues get me. I'm interested in policy. You know, I'm a I'm a Deng Xiaoping. I don't care whether the cat is white or black as long as it catches mice. And that's from a policy perspective. And with the raising of the interest rates, and that's why I go to fiscal dominance. The cost of financing the deficit is going to impinge upon a lot of discretionary programs, a lot of discretionary spending programs. Because number one, it's just that much of where, I think this has come faster than I thought it would, is that the interest on the debt on a yearly basis is now equal to or is exceeding the defense budget. You got problems. That's, that's a major problem because everybody benefits from defense spending. You know, I, I go back to my anti-war days and, you know, yeah, you can be the most liberal congressperson in the world, but if you've got a big defense plant in your district, you're all in favor. And we just saw that in Virginia, by the way, with uh, Tim Kaine and uh, Mark Warner. They were very in favor of it, you know, but they have a lot of defense spending. You know, we know what happens at Norfolk, um, you know, uh, so everybody benefits. So when you get to that state, then I agree, we're, we're talking all domestic, what the fallout will be on international, I'm not smart enough to see on a, on, on a today basis, we'll see over time. But that opens up the gates to some very nasty political arguments and discussions. And I don't care whether you're right, left, you're going to, everybody's going to have to be involved in this, because the United States serves a very important role in the world. 
And I think absolutely when we, and you and I've been around long enough when interest rate differentials, they only act as a support for a currency for X amount of time. But then if you don't resolve those and, and you wind up with bad domestic policy or failed domestic policy, you can have a, a differential, but if people are uncertain about where you're going, they're going to start moving away from your currency until they get greater clarification. And uh, I think that's coming. Uh, you know, Europe, as you and you know as much as anybody, Europe is a is a basket case for several reasons. And even Draghi came out this morning and talked about how they have to get to greater fiscal harmonization and, of course, uh, harmonization of their banking system. They have none of that. So that always makes the ECB suspect, even when the euro was a 160, but the U.S. was just so bad. You know, anytime we see those divergences, you are going to move in because everybody holds it. But I think the world, with its overhanging debt, could, and I and I know that many have, have gone that route, needs to discuss. You know, we saw it back in 2020, March of 2020, when the Fed opened up the, the swap lines, Right. Why? Because there was a dollar funding crisis. Are we close to that now? I'm beginning to think so, because a huge amount of debt, dollar debt, denominated dollar debt in foreign hands could become a problem. So then what does the Fed do? So I always say they have a triple mandate that they're lying because as the world's reserve currency, you have to fill that role. Yeah, I'm concerned about the, uh, you know, there's this, there's a sense, in, you know, we, we've seen this, uh, uh, actually, I had, uh, I had been teaching at NYU for uh, many years, and I, and I began uh, um, uh, teaching at uh, Borough of Manhattan uh, Community College uh, just before COVID. And uh, we were talking, the class was really fascinated, uh, a constant theme throughout the class from the students was deglobalization. And we still have that idea now, even though I think it's uh, I, th I think it's grossly exaggerated. Um, partly because I think globalization itself was grossly exaggerated. I think what we're really looking at, uh, oftentimes, is regionalization, hubs, and this is why I would take exception with the idea that uh, globalization has really been about labor arbitrage. When I look at a survey of current business, which you could Google, the government publishes it, and they uh, published this report on the activity of U.S. multinationals, and what it does include is employment. And I think that you'd find that, it's much to my surprise when I began looking at it, is that most U.S. multinational employment overseas is in high-wage economies, Europe, Canada, Japan. We had, The problem is there's not enough U.S. jobs, U.S. multinationals, say, sub-Saharan Africa. And though U.S. companies aren't really attracted to cheap labor as much as they want to be close to their customers. And so, uh, but I do think that this deglobalization de-dollarization is really exaggerated, but I, I fear that rather than encroachment, rather than China, uh, Chinese RMB replacing a dollar, or earlier in my career it was going to be the yen. Uh, I remember when the euro was born, people said it was going to be the euro. We've had a lot of pretenders, uh, but I think for me, I am more concerned about what I'd call as abdication. The U.S. takes policies that no longer support its role as a global currency, while uh, the opposite side would be encroachment. Someone else takes it away from us. And I say possible, but unlikely. More likely, we shoot ourselves in the foot. Well, that's, you know, well, Richard, where do you want to go from there? Right? It's because it'll bleed into other areas. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to get your perspective, Mark, on given all these dynamics and trends, uh, how you see the major currencies uh, playing out, you know, short, medium, long-term, U.S. dollar, Japanese yen, euro, Chinese yuan, um, you know, sort of uh, any trends there that you're seeing? Yeah, I, I take uh, Yara's point very, pretty seriously. I look at that because, of course, when we look at valuation of currencies, they're not backed by gold or silver. So valuation is very difficult. Uh, we can, we can, we probably, there's probably a, agreed upon uh, half a dozen different models, say, for equities or fixed income. But currency is much more elusive. And I typically use something. I just try to find something that's like reliable, dependable over, over the long term over the long stretch of time. And I look at the OECD's measure of purchasing power parity. And typically, uh, currencies, the major currencies, don't move plus or minus 20%. And I was right. I mean, the euro and the yen are both more than 50% undervalued. 
And in my experience, and my experience goes back to, uh, I began working right after the Plaza Agreement, which was 1985. And this is the most, the euro or the basket or the European currencies and the yen have been undervalued. And so I, I, I'm not smart enough to figure out when the rubber band sn snaps back. I just know the rubber band is stretched very far. When it does snap back, it's very dramatic. So even example, last September, the euro rallied four cents in four days, roughly after it bottomed. Sterling rallied about eight cents. So I don't know when that bottom comes, but I look for the different possible opportunities. And I think that uh, an opportunity is at hand again. Uh, after the summer decline in both the euro uh, and the yen, I think that uh, we're, we're stretched again on valuation grounds. And I would look for, uh, and again, it, it takes years for this overvaluation to correct. But I'd be looking at, uh, for say, for the end of next year, I'm looking at something like 110, 112 in the euro. I'm looking at something closer to 130, 135 in uh, the yen. Uh, I think that the Chinese currency, you tell me which way the yen and the euro are moving. Uh, I could have a good idea about where the uh, which direction, at least uh, the RMB is moving. I think that the uh, the RMB tend to be reactive. Uh, they want to have a stable currency. You know, that's the amazing thing, right? For most of capitalism's history, there were fixed exchange rates and they would move dramatically when there was an adjustment. They'd be, they'd be like a step function rather than a continuous smooth function. And I think in some ways, uh, when we when the G7, you know, it, it, for me, it's a question really, and maybe this is partly the point about the fiscal situation too. In the uh, most of capitalism's history, tariffs paid for things. Tariffs paid. For, we didn't have a corporate tax because we didn't need one. Tariffs covered the government revenues. But once we embrace free trade, which means the reduction of tariffs, we've got to find another revenue stream for the government rather than tariffs corporate taxes, consumer income taxes. And so uh, uh, I, I think that the uh, that when we talk about uh, vol you know, uh, fixed exchange rates, we abandoned them in 1971 because they no longer suited the U.S. and maybe other countries' interests, other rich countries' interests. But floating exchange rates mean volatile exchange rates. And that's why I'm sympathetic to uh, ways that Countries have have adopted trying to uh, mitigate, try to protect their own businesses from these vagaries of the foreign exchange market. You know, seven and a half trillion dollars a day is the average daily turnover of the foreign exchange market, estimated from the Bank for National Settlements. This is just a mind boggling number. Global trade in a year. Is about $35 trillion. That means uh, by the end of business uh, this week, we would have covered in one week more than enough currency to cover the world's, world's GDP. Uh, and world trade in a year. World trade in a year is about $35 trillion. Global GDP is about $100 trillion. We So that the foreign exchange market is just huge. And to me, uh, the volatility of it makes it difficult for businesses, uh, investors. Uh, and I think that's part of the challenge now. So I, I, I think that, uh, that the dollar, I think this is an opportunity where the dollar might be turning. And might be turning, as I said before, because of uh, the changing interest rate differentials, changing Fed policy. Uh, but there isn't really good news uh, coming from uh, Japan or Europe yet. And it might not be until maybe even the second half of next year. Hmm. And, and very interesting points. Yeah, your thoughts, Ira, on the currency? Well, on, on that size, you know, I'm because I come out of the CME and I've done a lot of banking, uh, currency arbitrage in my life. That's how I was my first job that I was offered to run a business like that. So I'm very aware of the size, but I would push back because, you know, I, I, I got in trouble once at a um, Deutsche Bank uh, seminar. When I was working for a hedge fund in 2007 in New York. And they would say, yeah, well, it's a $5 trillion market. And I said, yes, except when I need a price on 10 million, then it's amazing where the market goes. And they took great umbrage at it. But being who I am, I hung out on a street corner my whole life. So you can't take that out of me. So I, you know, and everybody laughed because everybody who's a trader knows that that's the case. Wait a minute. I go, oh, I'm looking for a price on 10 or 20 or $30 million. <laughs> and, and yes, the market is that big, but it entails things that from a trading perspective, a lot of, a lot of people can't trade. There's a lot of swaps going on, massive amount of swaps. But if you're in the currency speculation business, 
the market is not nearly that because, you know, the CME probably garners. And I used to, when I was sat on the CME board, I would get angry about it because the marketing people would say, well, we're 7% of the currency market. Well, that's baloney. Because why should I compare my net total to things that I don't trade? At that time, you know, I'm not trading Norwegian Corona. I'm not trading uh, Swedish Corona. I'm not. So that doesn't entail. What am I offering to the world? I'm offering crosses on Euro, on uh, Euro yen, Swiss francs, British pound, or Canadian dollars. So that's a that's a funny number that we play with. And if I probably netted them out, the number would probably drop down, just like when Buffett throws out that number about how many uh, derivatives. Yeah, if you net them out, that's a ridiculous number because the net exposure is really not that great. So I, I, I push back only because I'm a loyal CME person. I still own my seats. So I, I always want to elevate. I'm very honest about it. I elevate the CME because I can sit on right now. I'm, in fact, I'm, as we're talking, I have my screens open and I'm trading and there's whatever size that I really want in front of me to trade either yen or Swiss francs or euros or, you know, any currency I want pretty good size facing me. So yes, they're very good. And what it means for the world, I, you know, I don't know. I'm, I I really watch the debt markets more because so much of them are tied together. That's one of the first things I learned when I began trading, how much how much these markets tie together. I was always amazed when I, I did a lot of business at Citibank in the late 70s and through the 80s to early 90s. And when I would go and visit and have a cup of coffee and talk, that the bond traders were totally had a firewall between them and the currency traders. And, and Mark Rosasco, who ran Citibank at that time, who was just one of the really great bank traders and, and analysts, I, I love Rosasco. And I'd say, why don't you tear down that firewall? I don't get it. They're, the bond people are full of information that currency traders need, but the bond traders didn't want it because everybody got paid by a separate silo. I go, Wow, you know, it was it kind of drove me crazy. I said, everybody's got work to, but that's what made Goldman Goldman. Because Goldman, I I would just go visit friends at Goldman. I never did any business with Goldman. And they worked together. There were no silos. They understood. But the big banks, yeah, you know, there's a lot of cross currents. But Mark is, I mean, Mark's been covering this stuff for so long. And probably of all the currency analysts from Wall Street, uh, sorry, I, I don't mean to paint you with that, Mark, but that's how the media paints you. So, has been the most knowledgeable across this. And, uh, you know, I said, so we'll push back up with, with respect and how it all plays out. I can't tell you, but I think when he talks about PPP or what we, what, when, uh, what was it? The economist ran the uh, big Mac, right? The price of a big Mac. So we went through those years, but I think on a, on a purchasing power variant, which is why people are flooding to Japan, you know, for the tourists, as Mark talks about way up, Tourism is way up. And it's not an easy, I've been to Japan many times and I love the country, but it's not an easy country to navigate for tourists because English is not widely spoken. Once you get out of Tokyo or uh, maybe um, Osaka. Osaka, right. Uh, but, but I've been up north because when I travel, I travel with my son uh, who's fluent. So we've been up to Hokkaido. And actually rented a car. So I've seen it, but it's not an easy car, but yet people are flocking to Japan. Uh, I think the yen, yeah, and, and it reflects, if, if I'm right and others are right, you know, and I have to give Buffett, and I'm not one to give Buffett a lot of credit at times because I have my problems with him, but he moved into Japan in 2020 in a pretty big way and is doing very well. And I would say, well, if that's right, the Nikkei will outperform, if, if that's right. I mean, You'll have a barometer to measure. And well, I fully agree that the uh, that the yeah. investment that this is an opportunity for the the undervaluation of the euro and the yen offer an opportunity for American investors. Many people like myself, my family, we have exposure through our employment through to corporate America. Our four hundred one ks are primarily in the U S. But I think that the uh, for me the uh, this is sort of for me the importance of this is that if you have a basket of international equities, your currency could be your currency volatility could be a third of your return. And if you have a, a portfolio of international stock, uh, bonds, uh, your currency could be two thirds of return. So I think that the, I think that uh, what, like where did the rubber hit the road? The, 
the overvaluation of the dollar means that foreign assets, foreign earnings, foreign products, foreign companies are cheap for U.S. dollar-based investors. And I think that uh, this is this is like one of those opportunities. Though, of course, timing is uh, is not is always difficult. Uh, but uh, we're talking about. A, uh, trends that take a while, that take years to really unfold and to complete, which is one of the reasons why I love the foreign exchange market. Besides the size, 24 hour a day market, it becomes the key to other types of investment. And so I think that from the international perspective, what we could do, a takeaway point for me would be the, the terribly overvalued US dollar uh, makes it. Uh, it makes it an opportune time for Americans to think about diversifying, uh, like Buffett has done, into uh, Japan and into uh, Western Europe. Even though the news stream isn't good, the currency, as the dollar adjusts, it becomes a uh, becomes a nice tailwind uh, after you do your homework about buying undervalued assets. And and just further to that, in uh, recently uh, you had an interview article in the market ch the financial online news uh, from Switzerland. Um, it, it was entitled, We Are Going to See a Dramatic Slowdown. But uh, towards the end, you mentioned European and Japanese assets. Any Anything in particular there, like specific sectors that you like or would suggest? That, is it in equities or, or bonds or, or both or other, other types of assets? Yeah, what, I, what I'm looking at really, and I'm thinking about it, is... Uh, uh, there is a import substitution strategy, and by that I mean instead of uh, uh, instead of buying things from abroad, uh, increasingly not only the U.S., uh, China, Europe, Japan, a lot of large economies want to produce more of some uh, selected goods. Maybe this is that industrial policy, more goods produced locally. And I think that uh, what the governments uh, are doing is they're opening up the public trough, if you will, and giving money to businesses, uh, especially when they try to target certain things like in the U.S., uh, chips or AI or maybe uh, EV, green technology. And so there's a lot of public money available uh, in, uh, in a lot of countries. And I think that uh, that's where I'd be looking at those sectors that have already been identified by policymakers giving money. So that's like the cutting edge things, manufacturing. And, and to, to Ira's point about the manufacturing and the uh, uh, sort of the, to me, it's no longer uh, we might get manufacturing coming back into the U.S. because of these uh, policies, but it might not be labor intensive. That is, modern factories are automated, robotics, AI, all this other stuff that we can get the manufacturing capacity. We can make bullets or face masks or a medicine more in the U.S. than we and we don't have to rely on India or China as much. Uh, but it doesn't mean we're going to have to necessarily employ a lot of people in those sectors. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's really my concern is that so the sectors is that the uh, governments around the world are having we've gone from this uh, globalization, uh, export oriented type of approaches uh, to now import substitution. And that's offering incentives for businesses to locate locally and you get government money to do so. Interesting. Great. And your thoughts, Ira, on that? Jake Sullivan's new industrial policy that I mean, it's really what it's, you know, again, Small yard, big fence. Who's gonna, who? They're going to let in. Who's going to partake in it? But when you when currencies are moving around, and I see it now, my favorite stock today is, is we're on. Is you know I love Tokyo Mitsubishi. It's getting beat up pretty good today. It's probably down five six percent out of nowhere. I don't know why I haven't uh, read the news, but probably because we're not getting anything out of Japan in any kind of positive way. But as I as as several times I've noted with the weekend. And the United States pushing Japan to spend more on defense. There's going to be a lot of competition now for the defense spending dollar around the world. And look, at the Japanese are very capable re-engineers of product. And history shows you that they can build a defense industry. And I think you're going to see them. And they're going to, you know, you see it in South Korea. South Korea, what are they, what's the story today? How Poland is going to pull back on some of the, uh, uh, um, tanks and missiles that they were buying from South Korea. Well, South Korea's currency, I would argue, is another one of those also in that PPP area. So the United States has to be a little more thoughtful here because they are going to have a lot of competitors and they're going to be, and these are high quality producers. These are not, this is not China building fit, uh, furniture and China building. These are things that are really well made. And, uh, 
you're going to have competition. So you better get aware of it, how it plays out. Hell, I don't know. And no, no, nor does anybody else else either. Uh, and then we haven't even talked about where energy changes are going to go, where what's going to happen with nuclear. Uh, you know, Germany has made nothing and we're not, we haven't even discussed the ECB really, but Europe is, it has some real problems and Germany under Merkel, I mean, the West loved Merkel because, you know, of her stand down of Trump. But, you know, I thought it was funny a couple of months ago that there was a statue built to Merkel in one of the uh, buildings in, in Germany and it collapsed under its own weight, <laughs> it was quite, which is probably the legacy of Merkel. And she delivered Gerhard Schroeder's plan to make Germany totally dependent on Russian natural gas at the same time. So there's a lot of things yet to be worked out and energy is gonna be a big part of it because Europe really has some severe energy problems and what's gonna be the cost of energy as we move away from uh, CO2 emissions and fossil fuels. So, I mean, there is a whole lot going on. And, and I think Mark and I would both agree that currencies are gonna play a bigger part in this and people are anticipating right now. So when you make your investments, search around to see where the, where the better places are gonna be. And it's expensive right now to hedge your currency risk anyway. So be wise. If you To hedge Japanese risk, you know, that's why the swaps market has been back and forth because it's expensive and you're gonna pay away your entire cost of what you may make and putting your hedges out. You know, we, we've been here before, which is, and what's going to happen when you wait it actually wakes up and says, okay, we're getting out of this negative interest rates, which is a joke anyway. And we're going to let the market kind of go. Let's see where we're going to go here. Um, and maybe, maybe the Japanese 10 years is going to go to 2%. Maybe, maybe two and a half percent. Now, what will that mean for Japan? Yes, you're going to have deficit issues. But everybody has definitely tell me what the deficit issue is in Europe. It's it's here. I'm looking at my Bloomberg run this morning, and it's amazing how many yield curves have shifted from from inverted to positively sold. And most of the ones that are positively steep are countries that the market senses has debt issues. Italy. Italy is actually, uh, Japan is positive 73. And I'm talking about the 210. J Japan's 73, 74. Italy is 79. Even Greece, which Greece is such an important place because of what they had to go through with an internal devaluation and the pain and suffering that it caused. Greece is at positive 74. The, the curves that are still inverted like Ireland and Germany and the U.S. and Canada, people aren't figuring yet that they have as dominant a, uh, a debt issue. But all the positively slope, all the curves that have steepened are all countries with some sense of debt issues. And that's a very telltale sign. It, I'm waiting for the U.S. to go positive, by the way. I, I'm looking for this inversion to end. And because why would I extend my duration? You know, as Mark, there's so much uncertainty. You know, it's where I've disagreed with people who I have great respect for, David Rosenberg and Lacey Hunt. Will a recession bring lower bond yields? Well, you know what? I'm not sure because it may, you know, that's why I'm looking for the curve to, because I can buy, find as much comfort in the one year treasury bill or the two year treasury without extending my duration and see how this begins to clear. There's too many unanswered questions for me. And I, you know, and money is, you know, is big money is always somewhat conservative, but people have been piling into the bonds, but I wouldn't be extending my duration. I, I just, too many uncertainties for me. Just uh, coming to a closure on our, on our discussion today, we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, your final thoughts, uh, Mark, and also how can our listeners, viewers learn more about uh, your work? Thanks. Uh, I don't know. The takeaway message, I think, is that uh, is that we, we live in a world in which the uh, maybe since the uh, maybe since it's Reagan Thatcher creating a financial superstructure 
equity, we call it equity culture. We talk about the size of whether it's the currency markets, the bond markets, uh, the financial structure that's put on top of the real economy of producing goods and services is just uh, incredibly large and uh, like a multiple. And to me, the uh, this is the idea still that uh, we live in a world that uh, uh, we live in a world of surplus. I have a small statue of Buddha, of happy Buddha on my desk. He's a fat man. And the reason is because in a world of uh, world of scarcity, the fat man is prosperous. But in our world of excesses, uh, we produce we produce so much garbage. That I, I, I heard that there are going to be more plastic in the oceans than fish. Uh, we, I mean, think about our, our lives. I mean, uh, more people, and I think that Lula found this when he became the president of Brazil. He thought his, he thought his country was hungry. Instead, he found it was malnutrition. They ate the wrong foods. You think about the BMI, the body mass indexes, uh, how large. And so I think we live in a world of surplus and the, uh, the treasuries, uh, whether it's the treasuries debt or whether it's the J Japanese debt and my pension fund, those are assets. And so I think we live in this a uh, very complicated world in which we, uh, uh, to me, the scary, one of the scary things, to so many of them, but one of them is that we climbed a ladder. How did the U.S., Western Europe industrialize, fix exchange rates, limits on trade, tariffs, uh, the capital controls? And now that those no longer suited us, we, we cast off our coat and we want a more relaxed fit. But this is like taking the ladder down for other countries trying to develop. And so I'm concerned about this. I'm concerned that we, we don't know how the story ends. Tyra's point, whether uh, we've never experienced so much debt, balance sheets so large, uh, negative interest rates, which are still mind boggling to me. Japan, despite over 2% inflation, uh, Japan still has a negative policy rate. And so I, I, I'm concerned about that. And I, uh, for me, it's always a work in progress. So I, uh, I'm fortunate to uh, that uh, my employers, uh, banks and hedge funds over the years have allowed me to uh, build a blog. And I post my commentary on the blog, Mark to Market, Mark with a C, uh, sort of like that picture of uh, Mao with uh, you don't see his ears because it's really him speaking to the world. He doesn't have to listen to anybody. So mine's kind of like a mark to market. These are sort of my reflections on a daily basis uh, on the blog. Uh, as you introduced me, I have uh, two books. So one was uh, published by Bloomberg, Making Sense of the Dollar, which after about 20 years of career on Wall Street looking at FX, I thought there were about 10 myths that I that I tried to debunk. And uh, I introduced a character there, uh, uh, Charles Conant, who ends up working at Brown Brothers about 100 years before I did. And his job is kind of interesting. He was he was trying to set up a gold and silver standards for emerging market countries at the time to be part of uh, this new global economy that the U.S. was helping to form around the turn of the century. And his job was... Uh, he was going to go down to Nicaragua, which uh, Yankee was Yankee capitalism was turned back against. But he went down there and not as a representative of the State Department, uh, really, but on the surface, he was an employee at Brown Brothers trying to get them to go on the gold standard. And of course, they did. And a few years later, Brown Brothers makes a big loan to them backed by their gold reserves. So the first book, Making Sense of the Dollar, the second book, Political Economy of Tomorrow. And I am working on a third book, uh, which is uh, tentatively titled The End of Economic Primacy, thinking that for the most of my career, if you had an argument that said this was more profitable, this was a more economic efficient way to do something, it carried the day. But now I think in the last few years, but it's, it's still crystallizing, that there's other interests that are uh, overwhelming economic, short-term economic interests, like national security, like environment. And perhaps even social justice begins playing a role in where we make decisions, not just the bottom line. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for inviting me today. Yes, likewise. And that sounds very interesting on those those publications. Uh, and Ira? For... Well, right now I haven't been, you know, I, I was blogging for, for so many years, from 09 to 20 to the beginning of 23 pretty actively now i'm just doing the podcast so that's where you have to find me uh okay i hate tweeting so i i don't i really hate going into that world because it gives a platform to too many people who have nothing to do all day but to sit and and they're not worth responding to so you know uh 
you can't, it makes no sense to return fire, so to speak. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's just, it's kind of pathetic. So I think these financial repression authorities, and, and, I, and I read everything. So I find Mark, when I want to find him on um, Forex Factory, they pick up his blog. So I will, yeah. I filter in there because he's a currency guy. And we both agree that currencies, because of their dynamic nature, if you're a static model builder, you better stay away from the currency markets. They're far <laughs> too dynamic for a lot of the static type models that are built. And I learned that long, long, long time ago in graduate school. I hated them. And they hated me in graduate school because I came out of a much more discretionary. My work was much more discretionary. And my advisors, they wanted more of a model because you can, you can take apart a model in a far more esoteric manner than you can when you're searching out broader and bigger concepts that can't be modeled and you can make your arguments, but you, you, you really can't model. Well, what fun is there to critique something that you can't mathematically take apart and model. So I knew that my days in graduate school were numbered. Uh, it was time to kind of get the hell out of there. I'm still not, as my blog tagline is taken from Dostoevsky, not, not from Orwell, but from Dostoevsky's beautiful Notes from Underground, two plus two equals five is also a beautiful thing. And that's the way my world works because nothing is ever in balance. And as Dostoevsky railed against the rationalists, I rail against the model builders. And you know what? I'm still standing after almost 47 years of trading. So there must be something to it. I mean, I respect models for aggregating a lot of data and making it convenient to look at. But as far as forecasters, yeah, I, I think uh, we, we've seen the work. As I say, and, and Rick said, tell you, reminded me last week, it's not rocket science. The Fed suffers from physics envy. It's the problem of having all these MIT electronic engineers who went into economics and they think that everything can be just formulated out and you're going to get your result. I miss Kindleberger and Dornbush. The rest of them can, uh, I, I, I wish you ate it wasn't from MIT. You know, I, I got my... I got my my battles there, but give me Kindleberger and Dornbush, and I'm good. Okay, great. Yeah, thank. You. Yeah, it's been a great, uh, insightful discussion. Uh, thank you so much, Mark and Ira. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks, Mark. Good to see you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Good luck to everybody. Yeah. Take care. Yeah. Bye. -bye. The FRA Roundtable Insight Show is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered as a solicitation or offer to purchase or sell any securities. The investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the show each involve their own unique risk factors which are not discussed on the show. Any discussions among the panel participants or responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of the panel participants and do not take into consideration the listener's suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Please be advised that you invest or speculate at your own risk. Thank you.